it has an economic impact at all because it's an art. And as such, it should just say, this is an art, and this is a creative place, and these are the things we value. And if we were more creative, we would probably solve some of our other problems. You were speaking about the next video that uh, Stripper and I'm clapping, but I want to check what I was going to say. You're saying the next video that Stuart Perry produces is my part. Specifically about our own we'll and we'll save the artists for a bit. <laughs> what uh, what impact do you think that video might have, and what's what's the motivation behind making a construction company making a video uh, highlighting art, public art, and art? I'm glad I got that question because I'm an artist, and uh, I've been an artist now for over 25 years, and I've shown in galleries, and art is a common thread. Perception, um, 
but in some cases, reality. Now, if I live in this place and then there's all this, these things happening, and then going back to gentrification, property values start to rise. All of a sudden, I can't live there anymore. But I grew up there. My mother grew up there. But now the rent's too high. So I end up leaving and being pushed out. And that is, that's a fear that's real for people in some of these locations where these things are happening. Now, is the attention there? Probably not. Is it really going to happen? Maybe not. But we've seen enough of what gentrification does for folks to assume that's what's going to happen. You know, Zach brought up Metropolitan Gardens. What, what was Metropolitan Gardens for those who don't know? It was uh, some housing uh, not that far from um, the post office, you know, really downtown where you know, you know, people live. And so with the new project that's there, you know, Park Place and you know, whatever the technical name of it is, and at the beginning, it hopes, it hopes it's the same. Uh, the notion at the beginning was that you have low income people and middle income folks living in the same area, okay? But I'm here to tell you, you don't know that. Uh, high income people, middle income people, sometimes don't want to live around low income folks. So it does what it has intended to do in those people you know, who used to stay in that area when they move out away from the development, now they can't get back here. And you see that in some cases with how the businesses move into these areas. You wonder about the flavor. Um, fortunately, Birmingham does not deal with some of the uh, conversations that a place like Harlem is dealing with right now, where people who've been diehard Harlemites or, or Brooklynites for so long are worried about where the flavor of the city has gone, where that area has gone. You know, we used to joke, I've been to New York several times, we used to joke about Best Eye, and yeah, we didn't know what Best Eye Best Eye is nice and grounded now. You know, I'm in a mixed community. We have, you know, we have a yard and delicious. <laughs> but, but places, these things change, and it is, a, it is a byproduct of successful gentrification. And so there is a, a definite worry in the community from people that their area will shift. And it goes back to what we, this whole main idea. And sometimes it's about class. And I, I'll say this and I'll shut up. We're talking about, uh, it's made by race mostly. It's also about class economics. You know, African Americans have run different parts of the city government for what? You know, forever? <laughs> it's the 79, you know? But they don't possess the wealth. I think it's less than 1%. Maybe it's more slightly like stop. But there's no wealth. So where's it? there's power in wealth. You can make decisions for how things are going, but there is wealth involved. And so we're talking about why businesses have not been included. There's nobody there to be like, hey, I got money. You need to do this because it's beneficial to my community. And money talks, whether you like it or not. Mr. Shree Simmons? I'm working this thought process to fall over my mouth. But I do want to say this. I'm about to quote one of the worst horrible human beings on the planet. <laughs> Donald Trump. <laughs> but I will say this, and he said something interesting, and it's just a kind of analogy to make my point. <laughs> Crazy Ben Carson talking about status about it, right? And yet, his credibility is to convince people that he actually did. <laughs> It's kind of the gentrification argument. It's bad for the neighborhood to get better. <laughs> like we're stuck in this weird paradox of like, okay, so gentrification comes in, yoga mats come up, Starbucks gets fruit, there's actually fresh fruit. All the good things come, and that's bad. So I've been burning, man. I, I lived outside of this country, and I promise y'all, I came back in like eight. And this thing has been a Rubik's Cube ever since. I did my best to straddle that line of, of, of not saying things that are not correct or I don't know what. 
But are we talking about it's a bad thing when our neighborhoods get better? Or is it a bad thing when our neighborhoods get better and the people are no longer there? So you have to ask the question, what made the neighborhood get better? Where is the failure in leadership of the people who were there? And I go back to the civil rights movement and I say that unfortunately, our biggest goal was to get some kind of respect as human beings, but we didn't go the economic respect route. We had the model there. Well, the king did the bus boycott. We could have been getting what we wanted. Just the other day, those students in Missouri made that guy retire. Thank you, sir. But my, point, my point is, why in 2015, where are the leaders that's supposed to get us out of this where we can articulate our own agency? What is going on? How is just making your neighborhood better worse for you? How did we get here? I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm on. Um, in essence, I agree with you. In essence. But it's not about complaining about your neighborhood getting better. It is your neighborhood becoming better through involvement. It's increasing uh, necessi necessary Who's who responsibility? Who is oh, oh uh, listen, that's, no, where, that's, that's where we agree. That's where we agree. responsibility is that? That's where we agree, though. But we, we cannot wait for leaders. We have to do it. Ooh. You know? But I'm saying, if we're going to, like, if I'm complaining about it, I'm also trying to work to fix it. And so we got to, if I'm going to, like, I'm, I'm complaining. You are a unique brother, brother. <laughs> you <laughs> got the last event when I was falling out loud enough to be out of the side. I mean, I mean, but I'm saying. Don't get it twisted like me, or screw. Yeah, I, my point is, though, if it's going to change, if we're going to, like we, we just talked about, you know, is you have to make our voices heard. And we can't wait for leaders. We have to just do it. Now, if the people are not motivated to do it, that's where the issue is. And, and maybe they're leaving because it's things that happen around them instead of, I mean, they're complaining about it and leaving instead of just saying, hey, look, you're going to do this in my area. You've got to involve me in the conversation. Or do it before anybody else does it. That's true, too. But you got to have the capital to put that in place. Or the spirit, right? Or the intention. I think capital and intention go hand in hand. I think intention creates capital. I can say that. I started an organization here five years ago at the cusp of all of this. I had not a nickel to learn. I still don't. But I got up and I did it. And did it work? Did I try to be subtle about trying to get black and white folks to play together nice and run them? I did. But it took thank you, sir. I appreciate that. <laughs> and, and, and I think there's a broad issue of we're on the same page, we're just talking about that elephant in the room that is a very difficult conversation about personal agency. This is Zach, and I said, I wanted to talk a little bit about the policy gardens, just really briefly, um, just to give you some numbers. Uh, 2,400 people were displaced when the policy garden was destroyed, and there was a net loss of 570 um, low income housing units. And Brandon God shows said that. That Park Place was the grandfather of the politician. So anyway, um, we know there's displacement in uh, yeah. we know there's displacement in downtown, and we know there's displacement in Avondale. And I want to kind of challenge y'all a little bit because the funding for the transformation of Woodlawn is coming from Wells Fargo. And how do you fight a multi-billion-dollar transnational corporation? So it's not just Birmingham; it's national. It's basically.
construct the mechanism that individuals, white, black, Asian, or whatever, go through in this country. That's what we're talking about, you know, the, the perception that you know exactly what we're talking about. White skin, and controversial as it is, or white economy, I won't say skin, because that's, that's, that's not right. That's me. But the, that is, that is, that is what, but what I mean is that I think there's a white economy. And the white economy at the top of the food chain. So I don't know, maybe we the subject. I don't know how we 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 you know create a fulcrum where that's more inclusive, whatever they got. I'm not white guy. Exactly, that's right. right. So um, the way that you fight organizations like Wells Fargo and so on and so forth is you fight asymmetrically. And instead of trying to fight men's brain, small local institutions and small local economies that can survive and can compete in the global market marketplace. One of the things that Magic City Agriculture Project wants to do is a brand called Magic City Grown, which is a triple bottom line brand, which means that uh, it had, in order to be profitable, it has to be economically, environmentally, and socially profitable. This brand will add value to products and allow them to be sold in the global market. Mr. John Archibald, and before we go, uh, we have a commercial for Wells Fargo, our uh, bank sponsor for the evening. <laughs> One more question after John's statement, and we're going to open it up to you and all your questions. Well, this, this is sort of a question that I don't fully understand. I, mean, I understand there's a lot of um, animosity, really, between neighborhoods and downtown, for instance. Um, and when I, you know, when I think about, I mean, we're talking talking about the rebirth of downtown and that's what it is. Right? And so we talk about all the economies in these areas. But you know, who was I forget who was used to say you talk about downtown being a living room. And I know that you're, you know, if you trash your living room at home, and a whole lot of people don't really want to come visit and hang out with you. Right? So that if we build up the downtown area and we make it a vibrant place, how does that not our city's ability to, to do more economically. And I'm asking the genuine question, how does that, how does lifting up a part of the city that is likely to draw more What would motivate them 
point being is that maybe there needs to be more intentionality behind promoting things that are marketed directly to specific groups. Right? We tend to move away from that because that can be condescending, or we accept that like there's no real middle ground. In other words, like I don't know where that impulse comes from, but I guess there's the issue with intentionality. Do you want to have this clientele in the city? I'm looking out in all these spaces at the same people who are trying to present me for being the only one to ask questions. I'll ask one more and then we'll open it up. How can we, how can we best own, as Birmingham, our own unique history to tell our narrative? We have to acknowledge the issue. We have to acknowledge it first. And we've been talking about conditions with communities. What if Birmingham actually put itself out there as a community to show, hey, look, this is what happened in this community, and it was horrific. But look at the, the, at the talks, at the salad in the garden. I hate healthy part. I'm going to say healthy part. Because that's the health that you can come to here and get You know, more like a salad. All the ingredients make something. Say that. It is. It's about time somebody said that. Okay. It was bad, but it's getting good. Say that. Somebody up there say that. So, what you call the Holy Ghost, right? <laughs> but I'm saying, why don't we use, what, what is, I mean, what is Birmingham doing with, why are we running away from that history? Why can't we use what happened over that block a couple blocks from here to show, hey, look, you see how bad it was? But this is the city that we've become that is an inclusive city that everybody has a part and a role in. That is the best hope that people live here, in my opinion. It's showing how this, this city was in the dump and it's grown. And you know, the cloud that still hangs over this about 1963 is something you can't escape from. So instead of running from the country and embrace that and then show the broad base of the people who live here. Well, they used to be run on a day to day basis and see and listen. This, there was terror in this city in here. But not this hope because we are all on one accord. I mean, to me, that is, it's so nice to have you in Birmingham because you can see what we look like. All right. There's a microphone set up in the middle of our, uh, of our uh, audience area, dedicated audience area. Please uh, line up in a manner of kindergartner single file, and you will each have the opportunity to ask your questions until it gets to be all of our best. Let's, uh, let's give everyone a chance to line up so that the first question doesn't have a lot of time range to go short. And perhaps it's a good opportunity to get up and
that Vincent's doing story and fantasy. Story is what we're rich in. Fantasy is going to be something, it's going to be good. And some of us that built the story are going to fall out. I'd love to live back downtown. I built it. I just want to be, I live there. The car never got stolen because I learned how to negotiate. Every night I had beer sandwiches. I went to Guardian Criminals, my car never got stolen. Um, had a date one night, his car got stolen. It was a matter of dinner, but anyway. Um, I would like to be back downtown. I crave it. I never intended to live here. I came here for kids that studied ballet and school fine arts, and I was in a new friend that fell in love with it. And now I'm kind of short it, and you have to negotiate like a math and people. Do you know what you think is for men? And um, so I think the beautiful thing that came to be right here is the distance between story and fantasy. Let's take that well. Going ham and the hip hop vernacular is saying, I'm going to beat you up, I'm going to kill you. 
they're using that term in LA, Seattle, Dallas, whatever, uh, don't make me go ham on them. That is the collective that is in the mind of America. How those who happen to use the speak, like uh, he was saying, that's what the video is doing. People don't want to see that type of thing. They don't want to see Dollar Tree, they don't want to see Dollar General, they don't want to see Shanita's hair and nail salon on the, on the video. But in a city that is 70% black, and the majority live below the park, right at the poverty line, or right below the poverty line, that's what you're going to end up showing. It's sad that right over in, in uh, Roba, where I reside, the, the largest or the most powerful black owned business is Rim Time, and he's from Angola. We have to instill and inspire in black people to think in terms of ownership beyond chicken wings and barbershops. You have to understand that black people were not born to America to be viable, economically viable, and free. We were brought here to be pretty much what we still are, slaves. So we have to teach black people that I'm not doing any good playing for the NFL. How can I own a team? How can I own a team? I must first build up my life to be able to fit into that context. Otherwise, that is where we're going to be forever on the, the wrong end of things. In 1998, I was a student at UAB. I was writing for a black owned newspaper called the Birmingham uh, Heritage News. In my work as a student, we found that Birmingham was 70 plus percent black, but yet we controlled for less than 1% of the distribution and power and wealth in the city. Why? Those who have power were used to keep. Well, the thing is, the people who really own Birmingham, run the show in Birmingham, not what you see down in the city of all, they never gave it up. Why? The people who really call the shots in Avondale, the descendants of the Allen family from England, they're taking that back. Out in Roebuck. Roebuck used to be the wrong bridge of this day. That's where East Lake Park came from. Black people were never intended to be out there in the first place. Woodlawn is named after a slave owner. Inslee is named after a racist white guy. Pratt City in Prattville, Alabama is named after the same man. The largest slave owner in the state of Alabama at that time, who once he lost it in the pine industry, he parlayed it for the industrial industry. The people still own the city, so we would be a damn fool to sit here and think that now all of a sudden, because we got a black guy in the White House, okay, we have a right. No, people who have power, we use it to keep it. So the name of the game is, how do we inspire black people to no longer be the Indian, but to be the chief? But see, now, and, and it's not to polarize anybody, but now, uh, I, I think that we have to see, are we really earnest at reaching across the aisle? Okay. And like I say, this is not the band about anybody, but see, we found out, this is in 1990, and I'm quite sure it's gotten worse, that there were 1,200 black churches in Birmingham. But you mean to tell me that we can't get 1,200 churches of black people together and we pray ourselves out of a wet paper bag? So I have to know. And I'll even go to the bathroom and say so I can like actually think clearly now. But what I will say, man, and, and give a little round of applause. I'm really good. And I will agree with just about everything you said, except for one thing. I do feel I have to take a slight exception. Is that I would be doing a disservice to the memory of slavery to act like I am one right now. And I'm gonna give you some specifics to why that is, right? I know it feels like we're overwhelmed. But let me give you a little background about my specific experience in this city. I came to Birmingham, broke as shit. Oh, excuse me, I'm broke. <laughs> you know what I mean? Trying to start over again. That was 11 years ago. I was waiting, I was washing dishes at Ruby Tuesday when I first got there because there was no arts administration, no arts education that I was doing in Atlanta to do here. Fast forward real quick. About five years later, I'm sitting at the table across from at least two to three hundred million dollars of people who are controlled of that amount of money. Me, as a black man, 
So I don't know that I would say that, yeah, we have wage slavery, but I would have to say that my experience has been, I have been free for a hot minute, and I do whatever I want, and I was able to take the things that are in my brain, and they did an economic assessment over the last five years of what I did as an inventor. I generated anywhere between a quarter of a million, almost three hundred thousand dollars in taxes for Birmingham. I feel free, not just economically, but like with the choices that I make. And that's the point that I'm trying to get to, is that as weighted in this history as that we, we feel, we actually are no longer, I won't say no longer, but that we have the tools to get to, and that's my individual experience. So I won't speak for everybody, and I know that we have this tendency to get into group thinking. It got us on the group thing for real, like with Facebook. And, you know, it's really interesting time. I will just say that, you know, that ain't nothing about me a slave. I promise you that. First, I'd like to comment on the anti gentrification sort of thinking or crowd. Uh, I really don't think the anti gentrification uh, arguments apply in the city of Birmingham because of the fact that the city of Birmingham is filled with thousands of dilapidated houses and buildings. Uh, this is not New York or Seattle or Philadelphia or some other cities that have you know, undergone some of these gentrification, in which case people are being displaced. Uh, the example of Metropolitan Gardens uh, brought up. While the population of the current Park Place might be smaller, the demographics are the same, and the murder rate, the violent crime rate is considerably lower than what it was 15, 20 years ago when Metropolitan Park was in place. I would say that's been a big success. Similar success over in Italy at Mexico Junction. Again, that's not necessarily a displacement, it's simply a moving from the antiquated idea of government housing, projects, whatever you want to call it, into something a little different. Exactly. Uh, I would just, I'm not going to go through everything you just said because it's basically all wrong, but if you, if you want to, um, if you want to see the evidence, you can read my dissertation, which is available online for free. It's called Separate Tables, Segregation, Gentrification, and Commons in Birmingham's Alternative Food and Agriculture. I have questions. What do you call it? Displacement. What do you call it? I'm not sure that people are being displaced in Birmingham. Uh, no, you, you mentioned that the population is different when Metropolitan Gardens was, and there are things that are happening again in Tocino Johnson. So if you wouldn't call it displacement, when people have to move out and can't come back, what do you call that? Well, I mean, people, certain people are being displaced, but I think the argument that it's, that it's a one race or one class of people is being displaced, I don't think it's exactly genuine. Uh, I believe it's. Well, I guess, I guess I'm trying to understand. If you, you're making a, a statement, I'm not trying to, I'm really not trying to put you on the spot for real. Well, I kind of am a little bit. If, if, you, if you're saying that there's this movement of people who have been in places forever, and you're, not, you're saying it's not displacement, then just explain what it is. Well, they're, well, they're being moved from government housing to non government housing. I think the solution involves moving away from the antiquated decade old idea. Government housing. Uh, I so don't what was in place of government housing. Well, that, that's a good question, and I don't know that I have the answer to that. But I think some of that's called this place. And by the way, no. So we don't put people on the spot. We would like that after this event, immediately afterwards, and for God, your whole lifetime afterwards, we can continue these conversations amongst ourselves and form new friendships and partnerships. Now, we don't have to do this every, once every two months or three months or so that we can talk about these things going forward. And I think that uh, tonight is meant to be a seed of something greater and that goes far beyond just the seed. Thank you. No, I understand. Thank you. Thank you. No doubt. No, I understand. No doubt. No, I appreciate it. My, my only point was that due to the fact that there are empty buildings, empty homes, dilapidated homes, I don't think that Birmingham suffers from what other cities have suffered from in the case of people are moving into a neighborhood everyone else is immediately being forced out. I think in most of the cases, people are fixing up old homes, they're fixing up old storefronts, they're moving into places that were otherwise abandoned. 
They're not keeping people that are in place out. That was my question. Okay. Okay. Uh, you read the Birmingham Business Journal? Yes. Okay. The Birmingham Business Journal ran an article on Avondale about six months ago, and it said that the hottest properties in Avondale were old apartment buildings. They were buying the old apartment buildings, detenanting them, and repurposing them at a higher price point. How is that not displacement? If that, if that is occurring, I, I'm familiar with that article, then that is displacement. But I, again, I, I make the point that Birmingham has, a, has an adequate number of properties, homes, etc., in which so that people don't have to be displaced. We'll look at the economic article. And this group, again, please continue this conversation for the sake of time. Um, let, let us hear as many questions and uh, thoughts and concerns as possible. I kind of understand what you mean in the sense that there is nothing but limited opportunity in the city of Berkeley. And to Sharif's point, Dr. Henry's point, my Which 
which truth actually live in the heart of the building that was in New Jack City? Anybody in New Jack City? They're not. So they were thinking about raising the rent at the car, which is on one. He had managed to negotiate a deal where, this is how ridiculous this conversation each resident was supposed to just pay $45 for the application. And they would have owned the building. This is what we did to put. And he put it forward, he had a community meeting, and all the people come down to the center, and they were like, you know, he had dread, they were like, no, we don't trust Like, the point I was making about the language of progress is what I'm saying. Like, right? there's things that look unfamiliar to us, which is why I feel gentrification works in the You don't see it coming. Kind of like, you know, there's a quantum theory about the fact that the Native Americans, or I should say the people in the Maya, like before the Spanish come, they couldn't see the shit, because they just didn't know how to formulate the image of what it is. So where does that begin? Like, I begin the The point that I'm making is that I don't think, I think we're past the idea of separate from people that somehow the black world is involved outside of the white world, and that they're going to both dance together so we have to find the ability to see these shifts before they show up to our show. You know what I mean? Like, we got to educate ourselves. Zach, so you have a point to make? I'd like to just give my email um, information. Unify Alabama at gmail.com. I'm interested in this work. If anyone else has a question, please uh, send us a Thank you so much. Are you on?
what can we do um, as, as a, a community to make the effort of the mobility of the, the most impoverished? And you know, I also like to speak on a topic that you said about slavery and not dwelling so much on it, but there was a documentary on a television that said that slavery was equivalent to having PTSD. And I mean, that was real. It happened to people, and the effect of it, it's still happening. Not people where I come from, they are still broken. Psychological ramifications have gone on from generation to generation. And the information that we all have access to, it's not getting to the very bottom. And some of those people have issues that need to be resolved. And they back hundreds and hundreds of years. Yes, I, I'm, I am free. I am psychologically and emotionally free. But the ramifications of what happened to the people that came here and created the life of me to be born to, that was and they're still dealing with it. And I think that's one of the big problems that's not really being addressed. We can't take a, a whole community of people that have psychological issues because of poverty free psychosis. They can't just say, okay, well, let's put a business here where these people don't have to finish run the business because they are dealing with issues beyond that realm. You know, I just want to look at me. I'll go ahead and say this is something that we need to address the issue to get. A real rework, you say a rework, but the part of Brian Cannon that I see doesn't look like it's been born at all. It looks like it's dying. So to say a rework, I think it's an overstatement within itself. But you know, I just wanted the opportunity to address that and, and bring that to the forefront without the psychological implications that we deal with as people, especially in the city, because it's, 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 it's right there in our face. And that concerns me. 
That's bizarre to me, like in 2000. I'm not unaware of the system, but if you don't take your individual efficacy, what you do, I do not wake up worrying about what white people are going to do to me. I do not. I promise you that. And that's not something that I just create because I'm ignorant. rich culture here, very diverse um, people that are here. But one of the things that I would like to talk about is the generational poverty in our school here. I think that that's one of the problems that really lends itself to, to this division that we all have here of, about what, who's responsible for what and what we can do about it. We are talking about helping poor people um, and how effective that might or might not be, how effective mixing cultures might or might not be, but we really need to focus on educating our children and enriching the school systems while we are enriching these neighborhoods, whether it's through gentrification or whatever changes are happening in the neighborhood. We really need to focus on the children, show them what power they do have, Sharif. I would like to see community leaders, not just at forums like this, but in schools, talking to these kids and telling them how powerful they are once they find that within themselves. And you are a good example, all of you are great examples of leaders who can go in there and make a difference talking to schools. So that's one of the things I would like to talk to is everyone who is in a leadership position, we can't just ask where the leaders are. We have to be out there. We have to be the leaders in the school system and talk to those kids and, and show them how powerful they are. And we have to invest in the schools before we keep investing in these neighborhoods. And if we do have multi-million dollar corporations coming in, so we don't have to fight with them. We can work with them. We can use what they have. We need their money. We need to convince them that we, if they're the enemy, then we need to see what common ground they have and how we can work together. And if all they can do for us is throw money at our school systems, then let them do that. Thank you so much for that. I want to give a quick little plug to a wonderful organization here at Birmingham. It's called the Birmingham Education Foundation. I'm wearing a pin of theirs right now. They do incredible work in Birmingham.